Good morning, good afternoon, and good night, everybody. <clears throat> Thank you for joining us today for another Eloquence Educational Webinar. We're here with Dr. Wu Peng Hung to discuss the technical tips and tricks on transferamal and endoscopic lumbar surgeries in upper and lower lumbar spine. We're going to allow about a minute or two to uh, let everybody join, and then we'll begin with today's event. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Wu Peng Hung. <clears throat> Dr. Wu Peng Hung is a consultant orthopedic surgeon practicing at the NTFGH, a member of the National University Health System. He is also an ass uh, assistant press professor in the National University of Singapore. Dr. Wu Wu's surgical ex expertise is in the whole spectrum of spinal surgery, including spinal decompression, fusions, uh, de degenerative conditions of the cervical and lumbar spine, spinal trauma, and endoscopic spine surgery and minimally invasive spine surgery. He spent two years out of Singapore after obtaining several fellowship awards and international fellowship training in minimally invasive endoscopic spine surgery and open complex surgery. He also obtained uh, the AO Spine uh, North American Fellowship during which he learned minimally invasive uh, spine surgery, adult spinal deformity and spinal tumor surgery at one of the top accredited AO Spine units in North America, the Toronto Western Hospital. He also had a spinal trauma, trauma fellowship in the University of Heidelberg, Germany. Despite his wide spectrum of spine training and his main academic interest in spinal endoscopy, in the past two years, he has authored more than 40 publications in spinal endoscopy related articles and currently 70% of his spine practice is done using spinal endoscopy. So you have one of the best here to, to learn about one of the, uh, one of the uh, great topics about endoscopic spine surgery. Dr. Wu, we thank you for being here with us today, and the stage is yours to share with the audience. Okay, thank you, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on which part of the world you're in. Uh, today, I will do it a bit differently than um, most of the time when I give a talk. I will share my screen, and you will play a video. And in between the video, I would uh, pause and uh, do some polling. Greetings, everyone. Today, I will be talking about technical tips and tricks on transforminal endoscopic lumbar surgeries in upper and lower lumbar spine. Good morning, good afternoon, and good night to all of you, depending on which part of the world you are in. Thank you, Eloquence, for inviting me to give uh, this talk and share my experience on these technical tips and tricks on transforminal endoscopic lumbar surgeries. An introduction of myself, I'm a consultant orthopedic spine surgeon in Ng Teng Fong General Hospital, part of National University Health System in Singapore. My subspecialized uh, sub interest is in endoscopic spine surgery. I perform uh, uniportal and bipodal endoscopic surgery, uh, varying from stenosis, discectomy, fusion, as well as cervical and thoracic surgeries in most of the degenerative conditions that I treat. My hospital treats about 12 percent of the Singapore's population and the uh, majority of my patients in the cohort actually are uh, adult population. I acknowledge uh, my mentor Professor Hu Song Kim and here is my list of uh, conflict of interest. It's a challenging time these days due to coronavirus pandemic. This is a picture of me on the left side operating in the hospital. I'm wearing N95 in uh, the hospital has a shortage of beds due to uh, allocation of beds for patients who need to be treated for COVID-19. There's also, um, as a, at a certain period of time, a shortage of respiratory equipment. So in such challenging times, even as spine surgeon, we need to contribute to the world in uh, fighting COVID-19 and also in general to have a paradigm, paradigm shift in our thinking in spine surgery. It's more than just patients benefit of minimally invasive surgery with less pain, smaller scar, less blood transfusion. But as a result of a byproduct of these benefits, the patient stays less uh, duration of time in the hospital and hence uh, also usage of uh, less respiratory equipment in the case of uh, local anesthesia and sedation in transforminal surgery. It actually serves as a public interest in this new era of pandemic. So the benefit of transforminal uh, endoscopic lumbar discectomy is immense. It, it can be performed under LA sedation, which decreases the requirement of respiratory support. 
decrease the risk of anesthetic uh, colleagues exposure to aerosolized particles during intubation. And as a day surgery, there is a decreased need for inpatient beds. It minimizes the interaction among different patients and other allied health personnel and helps in the COVID-19 pandemic. In the recent article published in European Spine Journal, we find that uh, com compared to open and microscopic discectomy results, like in the past, they got copper cutaneous endoscopic lumbar discectomy, in China, and currently they are more uh, they rename as transforming endoscopic lumbar discectomy TLD. Overall, has a lower risk of overall complications and a lower risk of complications necessitating uh, conservative treatment. So, as uh, Professor uh, Liu Kim, who is a famous um, endoscopic spine surgeon, they, he mentioned in his Facebook post that he is happy to share that uh, there's a possible change in the gold standard for this herniation and uh, TLD has been shown superior in the systematic method analysis review. Um, I'm part of the group that have uh, looked into various um, literature and uh, write up on the various techniques uh, in neurospine as a collection of uh, visualized surgical process of ESS. In our narrative review of development of endoscopic lumbar spine surgery, we mentioned that um, the principles of and aims of endoscopic spine surgery is to provide a safe and targeted access to compressive pathology with minimal soft tissue trauma while performing decompression and fusion. To achieve that, the three components of endoscopic spine surgery are magnified visualization with a, of the region close to the pathology, having a working channel within the endoscope in the uniportal surgery with a customized endoscopic instruments of the length and diameter that suits the working channel, allow us to deliver energy and resect tissues and retrieve loose fragments in the operative field directly. There's constant inflow and outflow irrigation system that allows clearance of debris and clarity of visualization. I often joke with our uh, my residents that endoscopic spine surgery are like commandos. You are given a target and you start study very hard on the target characteristics and you are parachute in the war zone immediately. You take out the target and you leave the war zone stealthily. This is very unlike uh, infantry where we uh, we gather in mass and uh, create lots of damages and uh, take out a wider target. So endoscopic spine surgeons are like commandos. We need to analyze and understand what we are looking at and uh, take out the enemy or the target disc uh, in a very stealth manner that preserves soft tissue. So uh, recently, also we wrote up on the evolution of endoscopic transforming lumbar approach for degenerative conditions. And we have a proud long history in transforming endoscopic spine surgery. Um, Smith and all actually started out with uh, tackling disc with uh, chymopapain, chymopa, chymopapain uh, as we know that actually have some reactions to the nerve root and subsequently stop. Kambin uh, performed nuclear debulking with mechanical uh, crate cannula, subsequently also described the safe working zone of transforming approach in the Kambin triangle uh, in the same era of Hijikata. And together, they also um, uh, developed the safe working area of transforming surgery. But further on, uh, Anthony Young, Auckland, uh, uh, Dr. Rutern, Dr. Lee, Dr. Choi, and uh, Dr. Hyuson Kim, as well as Dr. Lim Kante, have famously described in various uh, literature that um, shows how we can ta target um, uh, transforming endoscopic lumbar discectomy using various techniques. Is described as inside out and outside in approach. And um, now the AO has recognized transforming endoscopic surgery as a unique entity and also come up with a nomenclature. So today we'll be talking mainly in transforming endoscopic lumbar discectomy. We also will highlight on the lateral recess decompression and uh, give a brief uh, introduction to transcambian lumbar interbody fusion. If you're interested in the interlaminal approach, uh, in the last year, I've given a similar talk talking about stenosis as well as uh, uh, scope, as well as that of the interlaminal discectomy scope. Uh, if you share my YouTube channel, if you look into my YouTube channel, I also discuss about bipodal approaches, but today we focus on transforming approach. This is MRI post-op six months of a patient. Six months later, you can see on the right side, 
uh, it was described by the MRI report that the previous paracentral disc had resolved. Uh, one of my residents did not write that the patient had uh, pre uh, a scope surgery or had a spine surgery when he ordered up the post-op MRI six months. And hence, the radiologist isn't aware that we have gone in and um, took out the disc. Uh, the radiologist thought that the disc has resolved. So it's quite interesting finding. There's how little uh, facet violation and um, soft tissue damages that we leave no trace behind that we had gone through a surgery. The standard indications for transforming uh, endoscopic lumbar surgeries, TLD, uh, lumbar prolapse disc from L1 to S1. Um, they can be central, paracentral, foraminal, extra foraminal disc. Um, we also expanded the indications to migrated, highly migrated disc, calcified disc, recurrent disc, and lateral recess stenosis. I'm going, I'm going through some of them. Some less common conditions, such as facet, discursus, and tumors, can be removed too in the literature. And of course, finally, if you if one performs transcambine endoscopic fusion, it can be used to address the foraminal stenosis and this disease with instability. Some contraindications that we have to look at, like uh, exiting nerve root anomalies, such as uh, duplicate nerve root, low lying exiting nerve root. Sometimes, when the ilia crest is way too high, it might uh, have to be a very challenging surgery, and interlaminal approach should be considered. Sometimes, if the calcified disc is too huge and it's really difficult, it can be a relative contraindication. And if it's a bilateral, extensive central and lateral recess stenosis, there's really a lot of work to be done. Maybe you should consider doing interlaminal approach. The basic and additional equipment that we require is um, endoscope, uh, fluid pump, video endoscopic tower, uh, working cannula, uh, needle operator, ranger, and the endoscopic equipment. Uh, some additional equipment such as that of the suction irrigation shavers. Some of uh, my uh, Korean colleagues as well as overseas colleagues use a uh, side firing laser. A trefine and uh, rimmers as well as a shaver can be used in endoscopic surgery as well. Eloquence uh, as a company has done very well in uh, promoting endoscopy. They have the full spectrum of unipotent endoscopic surgery, such as their towers, their camera system. They have varying angle and sizes that can target various types of endoscopic surgery. Uh, in the transforminal stat, uh, you can uh, have a longer, extra long one as well as the normal length to uh, target uh, different uh, habitats of patients. And uh, they have complementary uh, rimmers, uh, forceps, kerosens, and uh, different uh, direction of pointing forceps as well as the uh, fitting equipment that allow uh, more access to uh, the disc fragment that we require to retrieve. And furthermore, a radio frequency ablation as a hemostatic, uh, uh, in a way, agent. Uh, provide the energy that we require safely to decrease bleeding in the op operative, operative field. Uh, in the eloquence, there's the turbo as well as a simple uh, radio shock plus radio frequency that can be used for the epidural vessels. Uh, the burr also has uh, various types, uh, diamond, cutting, carbide, um, cylindrical. I tend to use diamond as my own preference. And uh, they have the advanced uh, evolved technology for radio frequency with different types of handles. Overall, um, we need to stop bleeding to have a proper visualization. You need to separate the muscular and then the arterial as well as epidural vessel bleeding. Some of the remedies such as bone wax, uh, hemostatic agent, increased irrigation pressure, of course, the radio frequency ablation is important. Also look at the mean arterial pressure of the patient. Sometimes if they're too high, it's difficult to stop bleeding. There's a video showing that we can uh, dissect soft tissue with the liquid radio frequency ablator, and um, yeah, especially for the soft tissue fats. Uh, using the ablator, they tend to uh, get, get uh, ablated easily. And on the right, when it's near dura, we can still use the short burst uh, RF to shrink the disc away from the dura and, also, of course, also stop bleeding of the, some of the epidural vessels on the dura itself. The transforminal surgery uh, requires a lot of planning. You need to understand the pre-op, where is the dislocation, what's the size of the patient, uh, is there a any difficult anatomy, such as the presence of kidney of a single kidney, also one of the uh, consideration upper lumbar spine that you might be a contraindication of transforminal surgery, or you have to be extremely careful. And the uh, relationship of the traversing the fruit uh, to the pedicle as well as the disc to the pedicle, foraminal size, height of the iliac crest are important. Um, in various, uh, uh, when we wrote up on how we can uh, actually find the distance 
of skin incision from midline. I tend to use trigonometry, I think, uh, because our MRI scan machine tends not to be able to capture the most lateral uh, margin of the incision. But we can always definitely get the height of the incision, as shown in blue, or the adjacent side if you use tangent. And then uh, we can, we uh, might or might not get the hypotenuse, but we can certainly get the angle that we want to get the disc. And that's the uh, theta. And using the trigonometry, the tangent of it, we can uh, actually calculate the adjacent side, which is W green, uh, which is adjacent side times the tangent theta. The angle of approach is important. If you are on far lateral approach, uh, lateral positioning approach, which can uh, you can actually get um, 15 degree, a very central disc, as well as, uh, as very useful for uh, L3 to 5 disc. We have no, uh, the patients tend not to have the low lying click kidney at this area, so L3 to 5 disc can go really far lateral. Uh, at a very uh, shallow angle of 15 degrees. Normal angle that we usually use is about 30 degrees uh, for our central disc. A steeper angle is required for foramenal or far lateral disc. Uh, lateral recess decompression and low T lift we use about uh, 45 to 60 degree angle in, in the upper lumbar segment as well. So we can see that. Um, so in terms of angle, I think uh, it's important for us to understand uh, when we are at the far lateral approach, when the angle is very shallow, um, so in th it's about 15 degrees, actually the Cambin's triangle gets a little bit smaller. So you, you might get into the existing nerve root more easily. As you get uh, a, a traditional or con conventional angle, then the Cambin triangle is slightly larger, so it's easier to dock without injuring the existing nerve root. No doubt, the far lateral approach, uh, however, can uh, have less bone uh, ventral superior articular facet uh, resection, so you can preserve more facet joint. In the far lateral approach, uh, most of the uh, people who perform it usually do the surgery in a lateral position, partly because if you do it in the prone position, then uh, our hands tend to be unable to drop so low. These are just some consideration. I think if in uh, experienced hand, they're all safe approach for lower lumbar disc. Compression and OT lift, we use about uh, 45 to 60 degree angle in, in the upper lumbar segment as well. So we can see the extra foramen approach and the transforminal approach, um, distance from midline. Uh, I tend to use trigonometry because the distance from midline varies due to the patient's uh, happiness, but in a uh, Normal BMI, BMI patients of a, a reasonable size, I think we can go by how many cent, centimeters. Uh, and the general rule is uh, you, can, you can go about six to eight in the upper lumbar and uh, eight to 12 in the lower lumbar. Some people use the radiographic markers, personally I have no experience in it, but it was described in literature. Too much coordination is required to mark the skin incision. Um, Professor Luzon Kim and I uh, and us, uh, we like to describe, uh, we also use manual palpation to find the lateral edge of our spinal muscle. Uh, if you are too lateral, more than beyond the lateral edge of the our spinal muscle, sometimes you can do a peritoneum territory, which is challenging and you might injure the peritoneum while you are inserting your scope. So we just tend to palpate the lateral margin of the uh, quadrilus lumborum and then um, it's soft laterally and firm medially and then we could get to that margin and insert the needle. So uh, we will palpate the firm part of the muscle and then there will be a soft part which is uh, over here. So uh, the insertion of the needle will be more safer you know, when you're just at the margin of the slightly touching on the firm part. So in this trajectory, you don't get into the peritoneum as shown here in the gray zone. This is what we mean by palpation of our spinal muscles. Uh, the working cannula are designed by various scope companies who have uh, two types. The type A is good for exiting nerve roots. They are also a bit uh, more challenging and difficult manipulation, and it can compress uh, the retract. Uh, it can compress neural structure causing pain. Uh, B is a common uh, usage that I like to use, uh, and then it's good for transformational work. While C is easier for beginner, you tend to protect a little bit more than B. Um, also difficult manipulation. These are the anesthetic drugs that we use. Uh, I put them into five syringes. My nurses label them. 
um, as you can show from here. This is the table set up for the scope and the equipment. And uh, I've described that in this um, chapter that we wrote with Professor Kim, and now uh, it will be available soon. Uh, based for thoracic spine, but it can be interpreted for lumbar spine as well. The positioning and setup in the left and right transformational approach. And uh, the real uh, live picture that we can see, I tend to place the monitor at the head side. Uh, the, team, um, the monitor for the endoscope right in front of me, with this, uh, slightly to the left with the C arm right over the patients. And then we dock in the Cambridge triangle, the triangle. Uh, it's marked by the opposite side, which tends to be facet, of course, tra traversing nerve root as well. The hypotenuse, which tends to be uh, the exiting nerve root, and the adjacent side, which is upper end plate, and the annulus disc associated with it. Inside it, there might be some, um, if you're not careful, uh, especially in patients with duplicate nerve root, that it's possible that uh, this can be triangle can be quite narrow and the nerve root lies inside. Of course, there's also risk of uh, uh, injuring other structures. But gen generally, the Cambridge Triangle is safe for docking. After we, as you can see here, uh, from the single incision, the trajectory in the in the uh, cafe leg, uh, in the medial lateral angle can vary into going into the peritoneum to the Cambridge Triangle or, or, or to that of the uh, posterior elements, such as the spinous process. So you need to be uh, careful, and uh, if uh, you're not sure, you can check with uh, fluoroscopy to get a correct trajectory. So we start the docking. We can draw a mid line, uh, a lower end plate line. Then uh, I, I tend to aim at a slightly uh, cavalo caudal angle, aiming to the mid pedicle of the lower lamina, uh, clear of the iliac crest. And then I palpate the skin and then I make sure that uh, it's medial to the soft lateral portion and then um, we, we get, into uh, get into territory of peritoneum. And from the lateral view, we can see that um, uh, this is the line of approach and that's the distance that we calculate X, uh, which has been pre-calculated in tangent. And it ranges from six to 15 cm, depending on the position of this and the physics of patient. I really do not recommend absolute numbers when doing endoscopy unless the, uh, I mean, uh, unless the patient is a very standard size and is a very standard this, usually you should uh, do pre-op planning to understand the distance from midline. Um, one of the things that we have think, think about is the foraminoplasty, in, especially in the lower lumbar spine. In the upper lumbar spine, the foramen tends to be a little bit bigger. In the lower lumbar spine, the uh, superarticular process may come in the way. It, uh, previously, uh, inside out is a very popular technique when the dilator and the working channel is directly placed inside the disc. And um, uh, we start doing the surgery intra discal, pull out a few discs, and then get extra discal to uh, look for the nerve roots. This is done without, so we discectomy is performed without um, foraminoplasty. Uh, there will be less bleeding because you dock directly inside the disc. This inside the nucleus doesn't bleed. But there's a slightly higher risk of exiting nerve root injury in patients with narrow foramen because you can understandably squeezing a working channel in a narrow foramen again exiting nerve root can be quite painful. Now it's more popular to do an outside in technique where we perform a foraminoplasty can be done under fluoroscopic guidance using rimmers, the front rimmer and side rimmer depending on the endoscopic companies. Uh, it, and then uh, there is also um, uh, uh, mobile outside in technique that uh, Professor Hilton Kim and myself uh, really popularized it by uh, using an uh, endoscopic drill in the direct. Uh, so let's have a poll uh, for those endoscopic uh, transforminal surgeon. Uh, I would like to find out uh, what type of foraminoplasty technique do you use or do you do it inside out technique? Can we have a poll?
Okay, my, uh, majority use the front rim and uh, some uh, and a number of about quarter to inside out technique. Um, it's interesting that some uh, of us also use Carison Ronger for the formaloplasty and uh, smaller number of people use the side rimmer, uh, about a third use the endoscopic drill. So um, as we can see, uh, inside out technique, when we first started, I think if you are a beginner, when you are in the first five, 10 case of endoscopy, uh, you want to gain some confidence and uh, gain some knowledge of pulling out the paracentral disc. Um, and uh, before you get into the bloody working uh, view, in a suitable patient with a, uh, with a sizable foramen, you can actually should try inside out first because uh, you might have uh, already pulled out the disc that, is, uh, that, that you require in the paracentral disc that you choose in the first few cases. Then you can, from inside, you after you do the discectomy and uh, decompression on the ventral aspect of the dura, you can pull back your scope slightly into the epidural space and then uh, control bleeding and look for the dura. If um, you are unable to visualize dura, then you can pull back the scope even more and then start doing foraminoplasty. And in those cases, then you can use kerosene or the drill. While for outside in, is uh, we we work from outside. We dock pretty close to the facet joint, the ventral aspect of the superior articular process, and uh, you can either use a serial rimmer, front rimmers, or you can use side rimmers, or you, uh, you can drill in, into the foramen. And uh, by the time you expose, then you can see the annulotomy site. It's either by your needle or the when the prolapse this occurs visualization these are the steps that we can do as you can see make a skin incision after we give the local anesthesia the plant trajectory um, and then we aim towards that of the foramen this uh this this video is done many years ago um so sorry for the poor quality if there any but aim towards the l45 foramen and then uh under the lateral view you can slowly proceed to get into the uh, ventral to the facet, and then uh, we give the facetal block, and then of course the nerve root block as well, using contrast and epidural, uh, using contrast and ropivacaine. I like to use ropivacaine for short acting, for uh, medium acting purposes. For lower uh, lumbar segment, your needle can be placed um, just medial to the pedicle line, get into the disc, and then uh, I tend to inject indigo karma into the disc so that we can. Uh, Light this up with a bit of a blue dye, and it's easier for uh, visualization and uh, orientation. After we get into a good campaign triangle position, seen in the AP lateral view, we insert a um, guide wire and uh, subsequently dilator, and then the scope. As you can see from here, uh, some people use a uh, rimmer. Uh, after inserting a serial dilator and then use the rimmer before we insert the scope or work, you know, working uh, retractor and then the scope. So you can see uh, it's a serial dilator. Guide. I like to use pencil dilator these days and then directly drop onto the area and then insert the cannula. You can see it's point towards the exiting nerve root and gradually turn it to uh, face the uh, uh, to face the dorsal aspect on the facet joint. Um, this cannula is uh, of a different company. I've since uh, recently switched to, uh, not so recently, <laughs> switched to Eloquence and uh, uh, other endoscopic company from this one. This is a previous uh, company that we use. But anyway, this video is uh, more for guidance of the of the docking rather than equipment. After we enter into the uh, foramen space, uh, you can actually uh, get into the disc area that you plan to remove the disc to horizontalize your scope. And you can see from this video, using the levering technique, we can push away the, gently retract away the exiting nerve root and gradually get into the disc. So there are a few, after you enter into the foramen, there's a few intra intervertebral root or intra foraminal root that you can take. You can do a foraminal root, which you aim upwards using the pedicle as a lever. Liver upwards, 
and or you raise your arm and then go downwards to a uh, supra-pedicular root, or you just go straight for intervertebral root. Depend the pedicle is your liver, so you can decide uh, how you go in once you're inside the epidural space. Sorry, then subsequently you do annulotomy. I mean, you find where uh, that is uh, where the disc came out from. Um, and then uh, you do a discectomy by uh, changing to a large forcep and then grab the disc. So uh, this is a mobile outside in technique. So that's why um, you, you start with the foramen uh, and then you do the rimming uh, or the drilling before you find the annulotomy. But while inside our approach, the first thing you see is inside the disc. Basically, your scope and your working uh, retractor already inside the disc, and then you will be doing discectomy. So uh, the annulotomy is important because you can then gain the access to the uh, deeper disc space, to the core fragment. Sometimes if your trajectory isn't right, like this manner, you may not get a core fragment. So by taking away the annul annulotomy, you can get into this disc fragment. Um, the indigo carmine um, stain the degenerative disc, so it's easier to assess and analyze the disc. And you can measure the volume by using either a syringe or the ruler for my case. Uh, at the end of surgery, you should have a half-half view where you can see the pulsating epidural uh, elements and the, and the traversing the fluid, the PLL, and then the intradiscal area, annulus and disc. Some obstacles will be there, you cannot uh, to, uh, obstruct your half and half view, which is the traversing nerve fluid, can be obstructed by facet hypertrophy, foraminal ligament, bulging disc, PLL, etc. Or your trajectory is not horizontal enough, so some adjustment needs to be made before you can see a half and half view. So some case example, this patient has, is a large BMI, right? Uh, L45, TLD, a patient has a BMI of 37, uh, right side, Prolapse, uh, paracentral, L45, this does not really be my great, great least, just um, at the, this level. We calculate the trigonometry, we position them in the Wilson frame with a radio Wilson table. Uh, we dock on the appropriate side for this patient, we just go straight. Um, with a slight inclination, we drew the facet. I'd like to do a mobile outside in technique. You can see this the right uh, SAP ventral aspect of the L45, ventral lateral aspect of the SAP uh, after drilling. Uh, we take a couple of bites, you can see the foraminal ligament coming your way, and then you take out the foraminal ligament a little bit to expose the lateral aspect of the dura uh, of the traversing nerve fluid. Then you perform, you find the neurotomy side and perform a discectomy to get a half and half view. I decompress a little bit more mm. of the foraminal ligament, you can see. And then you can see the lateral edge of the um, this, I mean, of, of the dura, and then you can see they're still protruding this right there uh, next to the. Uh, driver signal fluid, and then you can pluck it out, it's easily assessed. And after that's done, um, you put back into this, and you can see the pulsating uh, driver signal fluid. Just clean up a little bit under the PLL. Some people use the ligament cutter to cut the PLL, depends if the PLL is very incompetent and do that. Otherwise, I tend to preserve the PLL as it can prevent. Uh, also, a um, large this fragment migration to the towards the spinal canal, in my opinion. It's another case, uh, again, on the right side is a patient who have uh, not only sciatica pain, also have weakness of the L3, uh, uh, of the L4 with a foot drop. So we did under local anesthesia of contrast, we put in the dilator as well as that of the scope. Um, Subsequently, we uh, use the radio frequency ablator to uh, soft tissue dissection or outside in technique and uh, remove the disc fragment. Um, again, uh, try to, after you remove a large disc fragment uh, in L34, the foramen, you don't, you may not need to drill so much because the foramen tends to be bigger. And uh, you can see uh, with the indigo karma, it's quite uh, well visualized blue disc. And you can see three pulsating nerve root after you remove the, this fragment. For L5S1, um, there's a little bit more rimming or formuloplasty that's needed. So uh, at this point of time, um, if maybe if there's anyone who have any question on L45, we can discuss as well or uh, raise hand. If not, then we will 
can discuss for a few minutes, then we can go to the L5S one. So I did, uh, our, our talk will be, uh, it, it will be in three sessions. First is the uh, one where our L4, 5, L3, 4, which is uh, our lower lumbar. And then the uh, second one will be the L5S one. Uh, and then the third one will be uh, on the upper lumbar. Is there anyone with any questions, uh, want to raise hand and then discuss? Dr. Dr. Wu, I do see um, uh, Dr. Sheehan coming in uh, on the Q&A. Um, okay. <clears throat> the quest, their question is, how can you tell the difference between flavum and nerve root at 4-5? So the flavum, uh, okay, so flavum is yellow in color. They're actually, unless you do a very wide um, uh, facet resection, you only see the lateral edge of the ligament, which is foraminal ligament and they are yellow in color. The nerve root, uh, the nerve root tends to uh, be a bit of, uh, you know, whitish in color and there will be capillaries. I think the difficulty sometimes is the differentiating a well vascularized uh, annulus or posterior longitudinal ligament from a nerve root. And my advice before you think that that is a disc, that annulus, that's vascularized and you plug, uh, and instead you plug on the nerve root, my advice to you is become when you see a uh, nerve root, okay? I mean, become when you see a disc. You do use the radio frequency ablator in a short burst and then test by uh, radio frequency ablating the disc. It helps you in two ways. First, you coagulate and shrink the disc for easier grabbing. Second, if it is truly a nerve root, when you do that, either the patient is unhappy if they are under sedation or the neural monitoring uh, will fire up if you are doing under general anesthesia. So I hope that answers your question. I think the flavor is not that difficult to tell. Uh, usually it's just underneath the facet and it's yellow in color. So Petra asks, um, why do you prefer drill compared to rimmer? Actually, um, I prefer to visualize my foraminoplasty. So if there is a rimmer that can be introduced through the scope, then uh, I don't mind using a rimmer through the scope. Um, so I think in majority of cases, uh, especially in uh, four, four, three, four, four, five, and to a certain extent, and, to, and in lumbar five at sacral one, Rima is very safe uh, as long as you don't breach beyond the medial pedicle, especially if the patient is under sedation. Because, uh, frankly speaking, you usually if you push the rima a bit darker, I mean deeper, then uh, the patient you have the disc that's prolapsed, pushing the traversing nerve root. So as you get the rima a bit closer to the disc, and you push the uh, traversing nerve root, and the patient who are sedated will be actually unhappy they will say they have shooting pain down the leg. And then you know you have to stop your rimmer. So uh, in those cases, actually, you're quite safe. You don't really rim the nerve roots. Um, but it's just in our training that uh, we are comfortable visualizing the, the uh, formulaplasty. So we do it outside in and then therefore drilling. Dr. Hung, but, uh, before you uh, move on, I do see a raised hand from somebody. Would you um, like to me to bring them on? Okay, sure. Uh, Dr. Khaled, I'm going to bring you on to speak. Dr. Khaled, can you hear us? Dr. Hawad, Hawad, yeah, I'm sorry if I'm you know pronouncing it wrong, uh, but um. If you could unmute yourself, if you'd like to discuss anything with Dr. Hung. All right, I'm not hearing anything. So um, if you want to ask your question, please just type into the Q&A or raise your hand again. I'm going to lower your hand. So I uh, answer the last one for mobile outside in. May I ask what is the target of the needle? Is it on the SAP or the disc itself? The needle will be in the Cambin's triangle and uh, it will be exactly what you do in the inside out tank. Because we haven't rimmed the facet joint, when you put in your pencil dilator, 
uh, your working retractor will be on the facet joint. So you are outside, although your needle started inside. Uh, for inside out technique, uh, we tend to push uh, the working retractor into the disc. This is what we do not do if we do a mobile outside in technique. We do not force the working retractor, uh, working cannula, working retractor into the disc. We, we, we kept it outside. I hope that answers the question. Okay, if um, no more questions, I continue with my five one. We can ask more questions later. For no, this is good for L5S1 transform node approach. It is the marking, which is similar to what I've described. And uh, you can dock at the uh, facet joint. You tend to need to remove a little bit of pass, a little bit of facet. And then, um, so here, uh, I think in L5S1, the main difference is you have a large transverse process. This large transverse process tends to obstruct the angle of the approach. And you do realize that when you do a L5S1, especially in high idea press cases, sometimes you can't find it even difficult to get the needle into the Campin's triangle. And that's not only because of facet joint, that's also partly because of the, of the large transverse process, the bottom, uh, the caudal part of it. So uh, after you dog, uh, if you do a mobile outside in all remain tank, then you tend to take out a little bit of the transverse process in blue, as you can see here, so a slight amount of pass and uh, the edge between the pass and the transverse process, we call it mammillary process, we call the pedicle screw, but I mean, that's really the region where you uh, start rimming first before you get to the ventral lateral aspect of the facet joint. Uh, yeah, and, and you have to trim uh, the lower part of the TP before you get into the disc, especially in the high iliac crest. Some people even drill through the iliac crest to assess the iliac crest. Uh, um, the Girish Tata group, as well as that uh, in another Indian group, have uh, pointed out about the pedicle of L5. Um, we, we generally want, if possible, the iliac crest to be just below on the AP lateral view, the pedicle of L5. So they can uh, have a reasonable good chance of getting uh, into the uh, foramen of the L5S1 without um, causing um, uh, without a high uh, amount of resection of the ventral facet of the L5. So uh, you might need a little bit more steeper approach uh, in L5S1, although you're far away because of the iliac crest. It's a video showing how we do a right last mobile disc, uh, L5S1 disc. She has a sciatica, large foramenal disc, uh, prolapse, you can see the mid-lower picture. Uh, for her, unfortunately, it's a low iliac crest. So this is the tangent uh, trigonometry distance that we calculated. And then we dock the dilator and then proceed to do the discectomy. As you can see, the lateral ventral facet um, of the L5S1 is rather huge, it's really in your way. So you need to drill the lateral aspects and uh, in some instances also the TP as well as that of the pass in the articularis. They also have a quite a broad L5S1 foraminal ligament. Uh, you resect them away and then get to the disc fragment. For this patient, she has a foraminal disc and you can see from here it's bulging, it's really on uh, next to the nerve root, you can separate the nerve root. Uh, I find that sometimes this can cause a uh, significant uh, dysesthesia for the patient. This patient has uh, some post of dysesthesia, which require another separate procedure to uh, inject the local anesthetic with steroid to calm her nerve down. After that, she recovered from the post of dysesthesia. You can see that the discectomy is performed with the exiting nerve root quite close to it at the end of the surgery. So just finishing up the discectomy, and you can see the exiting nerve root now and the, tra and the traversing nerve root clearly. Okay. And it is a pre and post up uh, imaging. You can see that this is completely removed successfully. Uh, she has some post up British dysesthesia, which is relieved by injection. And she's uh, very happy. In the upper lumbar spine with so uh, in the in the L5S1 uh, the main thing is uh, 
I mean, we, we typically about 8 to 10 cm. Depending on the eyelid crest, if it's a really low lying eyelid crest, you go as far as 12 cm and, and you get a good angle into the disc. Um, however, if there is a high eyelid crest, you tend to need to be a bit more steeper angle and then you uh, get rid of the transverse uh, process and then uh, a little bit of pass superior articular, ventral, uh, lateral aspect of superior articular process before you get into the disc. So that raises the question, if it is a very high idea crest, is it worthwhile doing transforminal surgery uh, rather than uh, shall we do an interlaminar endoscopic discectomy uh, where we do not need to reset uh, so much facet joint. So in some of the L5-S1 cases, when really, really unfavorable, I think uh, it might be a better advantage to do uh, under interlaminar approach. Talk about uh, in my article, in our article, that um, the safe extra volumenal docking and floating technique, especially in the thoracolumbar lumbar junction, as well as in the lumbar spine. I think in the upper lumbar segment, uh, the foramen are larger. A facet joint is not an issue. However, we have to understand that the dura expansion it's getting closer to the thoracic spine where the dura expansion is pretty tight, uh, close to the pedicle. And uh, the amount of uh, CSF to nerve root ratio is uh, less in the upper lumbar and thoracic level. So there will be much more neural element and less CSF uh, in this segment. And they are in the corners area. So uh, where the real estate is uh, very, very valuable. So uh, when you do rimming, uh, those who are doing front rimming, uh, I advise you to be just medial to the pedicle, not, sorry, no medial to the pedicle, just touching the medial aspect of pedicle, if not uh, just, uh, just between the middle third, uh, midpoint and the medial part of the pedicle, that would be safest. Uh, as you know, I do mobile outside in techniques, so uh, that, that is not so much an issue because I drew my, my way in. We have to understand that dura expand a bit more laterally and closer to the pedicle of uh, upper lumbar spine. So um, when we dock, we do not dock medial pedicle line in my mind. We dock close to mid or just uh, medial third of the pedicle, not beyond the medial pedicle line like L4, 5, L5, S1. And one more point, uh, I think you can see that the kidney is uh, pretty close, uh, is in your way. So doing a far lateral approach or 12 cm off the of the um, midline might get into the kidney and uh, and that is a, a catastrophe. I mean, you have lots of bleeding and if you rim uh, in that manner, you are rimming the kidney, so it's really no good. So uh, you, you have to really be very careful in pre-op planning and plan your uh, distance from midline well. And uh, if not, uh, try, I mean, usually I find it is between six, it's usually 6 cm, if not 6 to 7 cm, no, uh, almost seldom more than 8 cm. Okay. So that we don't get to the lateral dura age and it causes uh, inadvertent uh, dura injury. So this is a video showing that. Uh, so to, in order to do L1 to this, you need to be a steeper angle. Steeper angle meaning uh, probably 45 degrees, sometimes 60 degrees, rather than our traditional 30 degrees. Is a technician who have three years history of severe, uh, three months, sorry, three months history of severe right radicular pain and he put to ambulate and quit his job. Uh, it's weakness in the right hip as well as the right knee. You can see uh, a significant L1-2 for the stenosis as well as the prolapsus in the right side. So uh, we did under local anesthesia. Uh, we did a L3-4 nerve root block as well because it got some form of stenosis that it doesn't get better. So we proceed to do the L1-2 discectomy. We talk, uh, as you can see, on just mid, mid pedicle line for me and get into the disc with the uh, dilator as well as the uh, wire and uh, perform a discectomy and this is the pre-operative state he needs to walk with a walking aid and after the discectomy he's able to walk freely This is uh, another case. Um, the video of that patient that's doing well uh, was a different one, but uh, this is a case somewhat similar, a bit more complicated with a downward migrated disc that I've done recently on right L12. You can see the downward migrated disc there uh, in the mid cut. And uh, this is a trigonometry that I calculated is about 6 cm off midline. We position them on a Wilson table 
uh, and uh, this under the we start with some LA uh, and then some make a skin incision. I, I think a horizontal incision is better, but this time uh, we, we did a vertical incision. So we put a guide wire, I mean a, a needle, uh, and the guide wire. You can see how steep the angle is probably like around 45 degree. And again, the Cambin triangle, we go to the mid disc, not beyond the mid disc. We did the indigo carmine to light up the disc, and um, subsequently, serial dilation. Of the disc, uh, and then putting the working uh, cannula retractor, and uh, we move the disc as you can see from here. This endoscopic view is a little bit different from uh, the lower lumbar approach. Uh, it's a bit more steeper. You can see the exiting nerve more clearly. Uh, we we did a very uh, much steeper angle, uh, also in terms of cranial caudal, so that we can get the lower uh, migrated disc. So we drew the pedicle. Uh, we can safely drill the upper third, if not half the pedicle. Uh, to be, to get a caudally migrated disc uh, without uh, any significant issue. Um, they tend to heal after the discectomy is performed in terms of pedicle. Uh, of course, if you do a transpedicular approach or sometimes if you do more than half the pedicle, then there's a risk of pedicle fracture, but they are common. So you can see that uh, after we drill the pedicle, as well as that of the superarticular process, then uh, you can see uh, we gradually punch out and expose the uh, dura. This L12, L12 is uh, kind of the coldness level, so we need to be very careful to prevent uh, any uh, coldness medullary syndrome, which is quite a catastrophic complication for high level lumbar spine surgery. So we are careful and then we slowly using the adequate person ronger and then some exposed the dura, the L2 traversing the fluids. And then uh, you can see the dura here. Okay, um, the drill is quite safe. The diamond drill, if you uh, execute it well to uh, trim off the bone to assess, assess the dura a little bit better. Then we hook out the disc fragment you can see here and retrieve it. For this patient, it's very degenerated, so it has multiple small fragments uh, that's downward migrated. So it needs to uh, be very patient here and slowly retrieve each fragment. They have a uh, various type of uh, offset. Some are flexible, some are angulated, some are straight, and they are uh, various sizes. Finally, we separate out the disc from the dura. Okay. And then uh, we move the last few fragments of the disc. You can, the last one, you can use a body probe to hook it out. It's the most challenging part because it is the coldness level. We need to be very careful, we're very gentle. Finally, we free up the last piece of the disc. There are like more than five or six of these pieces. One of the more difficult transformular surgery we encountered in the past recent, um, recently. And then you can see the pulsating uh, nerve root after we remove the disc fragment. The patient did very well um, after the surgery, uh, pain-free and working well. Okay, uh, so uh, just talk a moment. Um, in that patient, we have uh, a, a multiple fragments. So uh, he had about five or six fragments. And we can tell in the pre-op MRI that the disc look heterogeneous, not one single piece uh, of this. They, they actually have different shades of color in the disc fragment, so that's predictable. Um, I use a more steeper angle, so I have to intentionally do a pedicleotomy um, on the top half, uh, top third of the pedicle to get into the disc, uh, quarter migrated disc. Uh, there are people uh, and describe uh, that uh, superior vertebral notch approach, I think uh, uh, Dr. Cho Wu Li from Korea published a paper on that. They used front, uh, front rimmers to get the uh, uh, top half of the pedicle off using a superior vertebral notch approach. So I just answer some question now as we get on. Um, so for mobile outside in technique, am I correct that you do not penetrate the annulus with the dilator and the cannula? Yes, for foraminoplasty, uh, you do not use the dilator. I mean, dilator if they are small one possible, but uh, certainly not a cannula. 
I do not advise to use a dilator to penetrate the annulus as well because you make a you can make a big hole in the annulus and then uh, we tend to try to keep the annulus uh, not to not not making a huge hole out of it so that uh, to prevent recurrence. Um, second question for mobile outside in if the cannula and dilator is not dark and fixed into the disc, how do you avoid dislodgement of the endoscope? What will be anatomical structure you identify when you insert an uh, scope? I think it, that is an excellent question. I think uh, mobile outside technique, as I said, is a little bit more advanced uh, and challenging. A few things that you have to encounter, you have to keep your hand very uh, in a very fixed manner. Uh, you might get into, if you are new to endoscopy, you might get in, out of the foramen. And then you get into uh, the muscles and uh, you start dissecting with the radio frequency of later you get lost and then the bleeding comes and it can be quite discouraging so uh you, you do mobile outside in technique where after you are familiar with uh, a transformino endoscopy and then uh, what is the anatomical landmark that we use i tend to use the facet joint the ventral lateral aspect of the facet joint uh, you might see the inferior articular process a little bit if you are a little bit steeper in the angle. Uh, but we tend to try to get underneath the inferior articular process and drill on the superior articular process. And that is the main, uh, fine, uh, main anatomical landmark. The second anatomical landmark is the uh, arch that uh, uh, basically is between the pedicle and the vertebral body. So that, that arch is also an identifying feature. You can uh, help to identify it by both the uh, fluoroscopic guidance as well as under direct visualization because there is a nice arch that is a uh, pedicle and the vertebral body and you can actually verify that. And that keeps you oriented. After that, you can get into the disc uh, we use indigo carmine, so that this is natural, uh, is lighted up blue, so that is another anatomical feature. If you do not have indigo carmine, it's fine, then uh, you, you can also uh, look for the disc. Yeah, so um, that, that are the, some of the identifying features. Can mobile outside in technique to reset far lateral disc? Uh, certainly, in, in fact, in uh, far lateral disc, you tend to have a steeper angle. Uh, you might have you, you still have to resect a bit of the lateral aspect of the inferior articular process and the uh, and the lateral aspect of the superior articular process to have the working space required for your working retractor to be pushed in. So you need to rim uh, you need to not say rim you need to drill a little bit uh, to, to so that your working retractor can be pushed in. So when you are doing far lateral this uh, if you are we should try our best to protect the exiting nerve root. And one of the ways to do it is to do a full tube rather than a half tube. Uh, another way is we do the half tube and the half, half tube, uh, half working cannula, uh, but be very careful in retracting the exiting nerve root because they are very sensitive and, uh, and uh, it's a dorsal, dorsal root ganglion. And if you read the paper that we I published with uh, G, uh, Professor Ji Yong Kim and Du Song Kim, uh, the exiting nerve root, uh, this asthesia can be a bit much uh, higher at the foramen and far lateral this, so you have to be careful uh, in this uh, group of patients. Okay, so I will proceed to the next uh, part. How about revision surgery? So, uh, well, this patient uh, left L45 revision TLD, a 43 year old man who was from an R hospital, um, had a L45 uh, minimally invasive tubular discectomy. Done six months before coming to see me. He had the recurrence of the disc, severe left sided neck pain. Uh, so we did endoscopic surgery. The advantage of endoscopic surgery is under LA sedation, and uh, it's almost like a virgin territory and do transform no surgery to revise a previous uh, tubular um, interlaminar surgery, tubular open uh, discectomy. And then we do the docking, and when we did the discectomy, the discectomy surgery is pretty similar to our routine transformative surgery. Uh, you, you do a facet out 
um, forming all plasty using the drill, just trim a little bit off, not a huge amount, so it doesn't cause instability in patients who have previously a uh, uh, laminotomy, discectomy uh, using the open approach. So you can uh, gradually trim off and then uh, get access to the this space. You can see the annular tear right here. And then um, you can perform the discectomy. And then retrieve the disc fragments. And then you've got caught, uh, we cut a large piece of the disc fragment out, the main piece of causing symptoms. And then uh, you can see there's a lot of scarring in uh, patients who had previous uh, open surgery. I'm not sure where you all realized when I was doing the uh, nerve root block, I mean, not nerve root block, the epidural steroid, the injection, Ropibakin injection to prepare for transformal surgery. You can see that the flow of the uh, contrast is very ha haphazard. So that shows that it might be due to scarring. So they are not nicely flowing to the existing and the traversing nerve root. So these uh, are signs of uh, being scarred down. In, in a very scarred down uh, anatomy, a dura, very stuck down dura, sometimes when you give epidural steroid injection, uh, let's say uh, in a patient who have a previous laminectomy in L4-5 and you give an epidural steroid injection uh, with the contrast at 5-1, sometimes they don't even flow up. So uh, it is an interesting uh, phenomenon, and uh, I hope some of you have caught it when I was giving the injection. And you can see from the... So you are seeing the nerve root pulsating, but there are some this stuff uh, to the nerve root. A lot of that stuff is really adherent. So transformal surgery is really good in this group of patients uh, because you can prevent uh, having a dura tear uh, when you do a revision discectomy. Uh, we don't think it's necessary to remove those scars, so we left it and the patient did very well. I've seen follow up with him for one and a half year now, and he has discharged uh, back to working as the whatever he was previously working as a technician. This is a skin incision. He was surprised that the minimally invasive surgery, so called in the tubular surgery, is like three times the size of transform and endoscopic lumbar discectomy. Also surprised that we can do it under local anesthesia and sedation, but anyway. The main gist of it is not only that, it's also the fact that in the revision surgery, you can get into a more like a virgin territory and preventing a dura tear, and this is successfully removed. So this is commenced after the surgery. It's working very well. Due to PDPA, so I decided good. not to uh, let swimming. you all hear how story. we talk. And then he described that. Sorry. Uh, in my country, it's quite say his first surgery. Uh, he did well. However, the second one, he feels more uh, better because he, he went home after five hours of resting. And I uh, can, yeah, there's going to be quite eight to help him. And uh, he did put on the harness and uh, he feels good uh, to walk, to be discharged. Anyway, this post of one year MRI and you can see that this is remote compared to his pre op state, which is uh, this one. So this has been removed successfully. So the key difference in operating and the recurrent this is uh, the during revision there might be less bleeding and less bone work, but uh, you are, we are always worried about adhesion, no flavor protection, high risk of dura tear, and maybe uh, instability. Sometimes a patient who are not fit for GA may require lateral recess decompression. Uh, so. Lee et al. have described the various type of uh, lateral recess and so central lumbar spinal stenosis classification. Uh, we can do uniportal or bipartal decompression uh, using transforminal endoscopy or interlaminal contralateral approach, which uh, we also have written some literature on it. Of course, endoscopic fusion as well. So this is how we do contralateral approach, uh, which is uh, discussed in the previous uh, webinar. Of course, we can also do a uh, fusion, as we can see here. It's also published by our group. The uh, brain science as well as uh, coming up in Global Spine Journal. Uh, so in a uh, lateral recess decompression, we use a more steep angle trajectory of 45 to 60 degrees. Uh, this is a video showing how it's done. So we expose the lateral, asset, lateral aspect of the facet joint. Um, and then uh, we perform, uh, you can see the facet joint right here. 
you dissect a soft tissue dissection dissector. And after we dissect and expose the facet joint, or we do some uh, ventral lateral uh, foraminoplasty of the superarticular process to the extent that we expose the traversing nerve root, so uh, can, we can draw quite a lot of facet uh, in this uh, approach. Um, according to the Professor uh, Koichi Sario, um, if there is a significant degeneration on the other side, as well as decrease this height, uh, complete even in his hair, in his series, a complete uh, ventral lateral facetectomy does not give rise to instability. Although I personally do not reset the whole facet, a reset was required to see the traversing the fruit. As you can see here, um, with the decompression. So you can see at the end of the decompression, you can see the traversing nerve root as well as the exiting nerve root very clearly. So you have a bulging disc, but not, not actually a prolapse disc. You can take them out as well. And in this case, we chose to leave it as there's no uh, annular tear. We just uh, shrink the disc and see the traversing nerve root and then the exiting nerve root pulsating after the lateral decompression. So in uh, T, uh, TLF transfer amino endoscopic lumbar uh, forminotomy, uh, you do take out um, quite a significant amount of the inferior articular process, expose the facet joint and take out the superior articular process uh, to the extent that you feel that the patient is decompressed uh, preoperatively. And then uh, you will actually see the traversing and the exiting nerve roots as well as uh, if there's any disfragment. Uh, this uh, advantage is that it's under, uh, under local anesthesia station. So in my practice, I do this when a patient is really unfit for general anesthesia. And then uh, another uh, good point is that, uh, I mean, uh, the Japanese group, uh, Professor Sario, have mentioned that they did in the series, if they have a very collapsed disc and the uh, contralateral side, the set are pristine, there's not significant listicis. If you take, even for them, they take out the entire facet. Uh, of the SAP, entire SA, uh, superior articular process, there isn't uh, instability in that series. So it's quite a powerful tool for lateral recess decompression. Of course, it's time, more time consuming, especially if you are, if, if the surgeon is not comfortable with doing uh, drilling in an endoscopy. Um, I don't advise doing TELF uh, by brimming alone. You can brim half of it, but you can just keep rimming and keep going until you hit the nerve root. So the last part, you still need drilling. So you should be competent in drilling before you try TLF. Um, this is a video showing an end plate preparation and fusion. We have written it up due to limitation of time. Uh, please review this literature that I published with uh, Professor Lisa Kim and uh, Professor Koichi Sario on the endoscopic fusion technique. You can actually use the adequate scope as well as other uh, unit portal or transform your scope to uh, perform very uh, detailed discectomy. You use a steeper angle, of course, and now uh, you can see that we are preparing the end plate here. This, this is uh, more or less removed, and then we denude the end plate. You can use the probe as well to denude the end plate off. Uh, in uh, very degenerated cases and spondylolysis, uh, the end plate are very friable and can be removed uh, quite easily with this prep. And then subsequently, you can insert the cage, as we can show here with some specialized retractor. You need to know how to handle complication in terms of hem hem hematoma hemostasis. We have discussed that earlier. And uh, we also have published about our series on how to handle incidental durotomy. And uh, we basically, for anyone with uh, more than uh, CM, consider open closure or less than 7 mm to you can consider using a tackle seal a patch block blocking techniques. This patient. Uh, had a transformative surgery in another hospital. You can say, see that they their front rumor calling a huge neural tear and a nerve root uh, herniation, which we required to fuse the patient and open up the facet as well as uh, repair direct under vision. So uh, this case is quite interesting. It's done in another hospital, but I have access to the pre-op image. I think 
the thing is this station, this is the L34 transformula endorsed to pick up bar uh, discectomy. Uh, however, the patient has significant uh, foraminal stenosis, which where the ventral facet, uh, hypertrophic facet, as well as the flavum is uh, pushing the, the uh, traversing nerve root eventually. Uh, and unlike having a prolapse this uh, in, a, in a patient who have a, um, spinal uh, stenosis, then the nerve root are actually pushed closer to the docking area in the campaign triangle. So once you rim, uh, once you rim uh, beyond the medial pedicle line, and that I suppose is what happened, uh, then uh, uh, under fluoroscopy and under general anesthesia, the patient have no chance to tell you. By the time the EMG uh, have firing, uh, there will be, a, a, in, but in this case, already a dura attack. So uh, be very careful in spinal stenosis cases. Spinal stenosis, can, you can consider treating the spinal stenosis first with, uh, like for example, interlaminal stenosis scope. Eloquence have a very good set of it. And then, uh, if you feel that it's very difficult to retrieve the disc from L34, I have tried combined approach with transformer approach, but uh, often you can continue with the interlaminar and uh, take out the disc. So um, in stenosis cases, I uh, really have to be careful in uh, remake, as you can see here. And uh, on other occasion, in a smaller dura tear, you can use the packing with the tackle seal and the tissue glue to solve the problem. This is how we handle exiting nerve root injury uh, and uh, dysesthesia. It can be quite common in a very tight foramen, so we need to be careful. Um, sometimes we need to use the contralateral, interlaminal, contralateral approach in this type of cases. Inadequate decompression is a real problem, so we need to uh, be clear on the steps and uh, obtain a half and a half view to inspect the nerve root thoroughly. Um, there's uh, some questions about whether we should wear brace uh, in the SHIP study that shows that uh, it takes about six weeks for the facet joint as well as the uh, spine to be more stable. So hence the Korean as well as in my practice, we tend to wear the brace post up to uh, help to uh, prevent the discomfort of spinal instability due to uh, before formation of scarring. Overall, the future of endoscopy is bright. You can see that uh, this is the minimally invasive tubular surgery and there's our transform in the sky is pretty small. And subsequently after about a year, you can't really tell whether it's a scar or a scratch mark. But overall, more importantly, Roger Harhato and his team highlight to us that there's MIS benefits, benefit zone as more complicated surgery is required a more minimally invasive approach. And in my mind, the advanced endoscopy is where the benefit zone is magnified. Um, we have published in our series that we can do foreign uh, cervical scope, which can help to prevent uh, implants such as ACDF and this replacement of course in selected patients. Um, how about doing transforming approach in thoracic surgery? Uh, I think it is a good method to prevent uh, ex excess fire, facet violation or instability or also safely to prevent uh, conus medullary syndrome or cord injury. And of course, uh, we can do for uh, stenosiscope in uh, patients who have uh, old ossified yellow ligament, uh, preventing uh, possibly in good hands, uh, decreasing the trauma, the amount of tissue trauma and the uh, possibly the, the complication rate in uh, patients in experienced hands. And uh, fusion, uh, we also described the various technique to uh, speed up the process of fusion. And um, finally, uh, in this uh, one, one of the more recent article that uh, we involved in, we also described the various uh, endoscopic fusion technique, uh, be it the facet, uh, sacrificing of facet preserving formuloplasty type of endoscopic fusion. Um, we now describe thoracic discectomy, and I think it's an AO spine article in, invitation that will be published soon. Uh, I think uh, we can infer that, you know, uh, as we get more uh, familiar with lumbar endoscopic uh, transformational approach, then we can start exploring cervical and thoracic approaches, which really give the maximized benefit zone. Uh, no one, no need one. I mean, we can decrease the rate of one lung ventilation, thoracic. Uh, respiratory injury, etc. Of course, in the experienced hand, the experience come from lumbar surgeries. Um, I welcome you to the future webinars. And uh, I, I also participate in many of the eloquence webinars to learn from the experts from all over the world.
Endoscopic surgery is an evergreen surgery. We keep learning from each other and we keep progressing together. If you have any questions, do feel free to email me. And uh, these two uh, posters that I found online tells a lot of story. You do not need to uh, create a huge scar to uh, let the patient know how much they have gone through. They have suffered enough uh, to have the primary pathology of a uh, prolapse disc, for example. And uh, we can just try our best to minimize damage to the secondary damage uh, of the pathology due to our surgery. And uh, I think uh, through all these uh, various webinars and meetings, we can show, uh, tell us what we can and uh, let the experts uh, interact and uh, show us what we can do together. And together we can all work, uh, work together and walk further. Thank you. Okay, thank you. That's for my presentation. So let's see a uh, few questions. Oh, how, um, the first question is, uh, how is your video so clear of blood? What water pressure do you use? I, I use a water pressure of 30 mmHg, uh, pretty uniform, uh, 25 to 30 mmHg. In my cervical cases, I stick to 25. In uh, transforminal cases, I go 30. If there's really a large amount of bleeding, then uh, we will, uh, first, it's not to just pump up the pressure first, push the endoscope closer to the bleeding area. And number two, when you see bleeding, do not leave the bleeding. Uh, there, you, you try to stop the bleeding right there. But because once you move around a little bit, you may lose the main site of bleeding and you take a longer time to stop the bleeding. Number three, if the bleeding is in the muscle layer above the facet, uh, post, I mean posterior to the facet joint, you just push your working uh, retractor deeper and your scope deeper and then uh, those bleeding points are behind you. Um, scope bleeding, uh, that obstruct your view happens usually either you have excessive bleeding from the behind the scope or uh, um, you, you have a lot of bleeding in front of your scope. So you do not really need to increase the pressure a lot. If last but not least, if really you can't see much, then uh, you can increase your pressure uh, to up to 70 mmHg. And then really quickly stop the bleeding. And once it stops, then you uh, can decrease the pressure back to 30. To stop the bleeding, you can use the uh, radio frequency ablator and eloquent that uh, uh, Dr. Oman came out with the radio frequency ablator concept and his uh, eloquence is the epitome of radio frequency ablator. You can use them. That aside, I mean, other company, of course, also radio frequency ablator. Um, so that, that is one way. If you uh, are unable to stop this bite and you're not very sure where it's bleeding from, you can come down before you convert to open. You uh, get flow seal. Uh, the flow seal, you squat uh, probably the, almost a whole uh, half of the you know, whole syringe. And then you use a kerosene and then gently push in the uh, flow seal. Wait for one minute and then, uh, or two, then you switch on the uh, water again. Of course, you when you push in the flow seal, please stop the water, otherwise you'll be washing out the flow seal. It's a waste of money. And then you you uh, on the water after about, um, two, one to, about one to two minutes, and then uh, you, you'll be surprised a lot of time the bleeding will stop. So these are ways to be clear of the blood. Uh, second question, how do you ensure complete removal or decompression of the chronic or calcified disc herniation via transforming approach? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, I have done a few calcified discs. Uh, one of the more challenging ones, it was in the L12 corners area. I should have shown it in my slide, but uh, there are uh, too many of this L12. But anyway, one, one of them is a calcified one. Uh, is challenging. You have to drill the base of the calcified disc, and then you use the uh, use the pen field dissector and push the uh, calcified disc down, and then retrieve it. 
Um, if you have drilled thin enough, you can use the ligament cutter and cut the calcified disc. Um, there are a few ways to confirm uh, whether you have complete removal. One, if the calcified disc is really large and you can see through the fluoroscopy, which is the case I've done, uh, I, I saw it through fluoroscopy. If not, uh, there are, if you have an old arm available in house, then you can uh, put in, uh, you can do an old arm spin. Only thing is when you do old arm spin, it's almost impossible for you to still be holding the scope. So you may put a needle in uh, gently into the disc uh, or put a guide wire into the disc, then you do the old arm spin. Um, and then subsequently, uh, you can still put in your dilator and uh, the working retractor. But to be frank, you, you should do your arm spin when you are really pretty confident that you have done the full uh, calcified discectomy, calcified removal discectomy. Then uh, if the arm is good, you just pull out your, your dilator or your guide wire. These are some of the methods to confirm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I tend to be a bit naggy in my answering as well as my uh, my talk, so I'm slightly over time. I hope uh, you all have an enjoyable session. If you have any question, I'm here to answer as well. Thank you very much, Dr. Hung. And this was not too long. This was perfect. The more knowledge that you're able to share with everybody, this the better they're able to equip themselves to treat their patients correctly. So. Uh, I'm glad, you know, this was an extended, you know, uh, uh, webinar, and um, I thank you very much for sharing everything that you have with today's audience. Um, before we do end, uh, end the session, um, if anybody does have some questions for Dr. Hung, I welcome you to, uh, to either raise your hand or type in the question, whatever you prefer. Um, now is the time to ask. Um, and from everybody at Eloquence, Dr. Hung, thank you very much for being part of this event and the past ones that we've had with you. Um, it's been a real pl pleasure working with you and gaining knowledge from what you have to share with the audience. So thank you very much for that. Um, Dr. Dr. Hung, if you do want to um, just type in your email, if anybody does have any questions into the chat, this way they can uh, utilize you for any questions that they do have about this topic or anything about endoscopic spine. So um, uh, I don't see any other questions coming in. So looks like you, you have uh, given everybody the um, amount of uh, experience and knowledge that they were looking for. So thank you very much for that. Everybody, you can see <clears throat> Dr. Dr. Hung's email in the chat. Feel free to email him for, with any questions that you do have. And I thank Dr. Hung for, again, for um, everything for today. And thank you for everybody for being part of today's event. If you have any, uh, any questions about um, our equipment, our trainings, uh, what we're able to provide, feel free to email us at sales at eloquence.com. Now we have all of the, the uh, previous uh, webinars that we've done in the past on our website. Feel free to visit us there and see all of the, uh, the um, educational uh, webinars that we've done in the past with uh, a wide variety of, uh, of physicians and surgeons. So um, feel free to you know dive in there and take what you need from from our previous events. Um, I think that's it for today, Dr. Hung. Thank you very much again. It was great, uh, you know, from great working with you again. Uh, you know, it's been a true pleasure. So thank you very much for for everything. Thank you. Got it. All right, everybody have. A Enjoy the weekend and uh, we'll see you all soon. Take care. Okay, thank you. Thank you.